Wow, let's get it. Part two. We on the ass, man. We on the ass, man. I tell you. When it's good, it's good. When it's real, it's real. We're back in the medieval empire of the Israelites by Robert Grishin. Peace and power to the fan. Love to drop nation. Everyone dropping this drop, man. That we get to get, that we get to dig on it and get it, man. We're talking Copernicus chronology. We're talking Fermenko. We're talking Christ's birth. We're talking about the Caesar's Messiah. And we're talking about Israel's Messiah. Now we're picking it up right here, man. And uh, page 55, another investigation is connected with the new star which flared up in the east according to the gospel and church tradition in the year of Christ's birth, right? We just got in the last part that, you know, year one is 1053 or 1054 AD. They added a thousand years, so whatever they say, year one in Christ's birth, you say, well, which Mashiach are you talking about? The Mashiach, Hawa Shuhwa, that led us onto our promised land, Kitsukoto, who led the Toltecs onto their promised land. Then, after 31 years, in the year of the resurrection, a full solar eclipse took place. So, pay attention to the astronomy. This is how Fermenko and his you know, cats digging on this chronology or digging on how they added a thousand years and what actually happened when they put together the astronomical events, such as during this resurrection, a full solar eclipse took place. All right. According to their writings. All right. So let's put it together. So we have a full solar eclipse happening at this year one or year of Christ's birth. Church sources speak clearly in particular about the solar eclipse in connection with Christ's resurrection. We shall note that a solar eclipse in Palestine and what is more and what is more a full solar eclipse, a full solar eclipse is an ex exceptionally rare event. Solar eclipses happen every year, but these are generally visible only in the narrow strip of the lunar shadows trajectory on the earth. This in comparison with lunar eclipses, which are visible all at once from half the territory of the so-called globe. All right, we're talking about the plane, so let's get it. Biblical knowledge of the 18th to 19th centuries did not reveal naturally the gospel solar eclipse in the Palestine of the start of our era. Then the solar eclipse was recast into a lunar all the same, true, it did not help because they also didn't find a lunar eclipse which approached it precisely. So they couldn't find these eclipses to match up with this year one. So when did it actually take place? Therefore, they simply ceased talking about the problem. They said, ah, right, you know, we're going to sweep this under the rug. We can't find these eclipses astronomically around this birth of Christ. What then was discovered? It turned out such a pair of the rarest astronomical events. The flare-up of a new star and 31 years later a full solar eclipse in the Mediterranean really did take place. But only in the 11th century A.D. Oh yeah, man, we at war. So these are war drums. Feel it in your ruach. You're at war against the hijack. You devour chaos. And what's popping up at the 11th century AD? All the astronomical events around the birth of the Messiah. Now, a Messiah is being born or, you know, prophesied based on these astronomical events. And what they're trying to write about this Christ happening in year one is actually happening only, not multiple times, but only, right? only in the 11th century A.D. Dig on it. So now we're talking 1054. Now we're talking the birth of. Kitsukoto of Joshua, Hawashuhua. We're talking about 
know what I'm saying, what's going on, you know, really across the plane, because when you talk about this, this energy coming up, they're, they're prophesying over there what's actually happening over here. That's their little Sears and, 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 and wives, whoever, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're putting together, all right, man, we got this Mashiach popping up. He's going to change the game. Remember, Preston John is the emperor of the three Indias. So <laughs> when you, when the creator sends his people, his, his messenger, they take over the board because they come in the power of the creator. And that's what we were getting at in part one in the documentary, Caesar's Messiah, man. Love again to, to the, uh, you know, big bro Vic, you know what I mean? And it's, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, man, when you, you know, start putting this together, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you got this new star, you got this eclipse, you got all this stuff actually happened 1054. And you're sitting over here and they're over there prophesying about what is really going on across the plane because it affects them. It affects them when you're awake, when you're out the illusion, it affects them. When the creator sends his messenger to free you, it affects them because their captivity has everything to do with keeping you as a slave, keeping your eyes closed. So this solar eclipse and this new star is actually happening in the 11th century AD. This is well, this is the well-known flare-up of the new star in 1054. We're back to 1054. And the full solar eclipse of 16th, 16th of February, 1086. The shadow of the solar eclipse passed, passed through Italy and the Byzantine. All right, so the Byzantium, remember, this empire was taken out directly as a result of the Papal Bull Doom Diverse in 1452. The Byzantine was taken out 1453. The next year they took out the Byzantine because that was you. We're talking Mazaka. We're talking about your kingdoms here and there. You were spread out everywhere, right? It is both interesting and significant that references to Christ in the medieval chronicles of the 11th centuries have come down to us unaltered. For example, in the chronograph of 1680, it is reported that Christ himself visited Pope Leo IX. I'm not making this shit up, man. In the chronograph of 1680, you remember they thought the world was in in 1666? Now they got this messenger, right? It is reported that the Christ himself visited Pope Leo the 9th, 1054, 1053, yeah, 1054, 1049. It is related how Christ, in the form of a beggar, visited him, Leo the 9th, in his bedroom. Uh-oh. Let's go. <laughs> Who knows what these hijacks is up to? As Anatoly Fodomenko discovered, there are parallels in the gospel in the biography of Pope Gregory VII, who died 1085. Man, so much happened around this 11th century. Um, I mean, you got a major, major crossover going on, man, that we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, cross our people back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To the side that you started at, to the starting point, to the navel. To the umbilical cord. Copper color race is found here. Connected to Mu and Lemuria. Man, let's get it. Anatoly for the Manco also showed that in many chronicles the year 1045 AD. The so-called fundamental shift of 1053. Of t so this is what we're talking about. Now, we got in the, uh, this drop we about to pull back up. Caesar's Messiah. All right, we're on the 22 minute mark at part one. It's a lot of drop, man, that we covered so far. So, you know what I'm saying? We already, you know, we already dropped that there's been a shift that, that Titus and Vespas and, and, and the Flavius, you know what I'm saying, family came in and created a paradigm shift. They called it a paradigm shift. And over here we have Anatoly Fermenko also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 AD, the so-called fundamental shift of 1,053 years in chronology. So they shifted 1,053 years. Do you know the importance of that? When they push your 
actual Mashiach back a thousand years just to squeeze in their Jesus, their Jesus. It disconnects you. You think it's so, 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 so vast, you know what I'm saying, in the, in the past, so far in the past, it ain't even connected to it. Because once you really, once you're in the thousands, you start to connect a lot more than if you were in the BCs. Once you know that this happened in 1053, that Joshua, Kitsikooltu, the foundational truth, <laughs> all this is already here. Where are they getting it from? They're Jesus. They're crucifixion. You were already crucified, Negro. They're getting it here. I mean, once you comprehend that this really just cracked off in 1054, then there yeah, you can start surfing the wave that the book of Daniel was written in the 1200s. And at the hijack <laughs> that King David and all that is rocking and you're talking about, man, all right? You're starting to put it all together now. Who is Prester John? Who is letting the dangle the wheat? The wheat. King David. Solomon. What's Kalelus about? It's implied as year one. So Anatoly Fermenko also showed that in many chronicles, the year 1054 AD, the so-called fundamental shift or paradigm shift of the Flaviuses, which then would also make them around this time, not no 70 AD and, and all that stuff like that. They would be around the 11th century as well. I mean, all the Rome stuff would be much more recent. If at all, some people say there was no Rome, right? We're just talking Romani or Roma. Roma is India. We're talking Roma, India. So they're hijacking all these titles. So this 1054 AD is implied as year one. 1054 AD is implied as year one. 1054 AD, the so-called fundamental shift of 1,053 years in chronology is implied as year one in accordance with Christ's birth or Joshua's birth. Here, Joshua's birth. Here, man. We're talking Zeus and Jesus. Satan's kingdom is hierarchical. And the evil one assigns his most powerful demons to rule over the various nations. The most powerful demons to rule over the various nations. How are they ruling over you without even having to pick up a sword anymore? How are they ruling over you? Through your religion, through your belief. They got your mind. They got all the various nations' mind through what? Satan's kingdom. Who is that? Satan's demons. All right. The most powerful of Satan's principalities is called Zeus or the Prince of Greece. Zeus plays second fiddle to nobody, not even Jupiter. Well, some would say Zeus is Jupiter, is Jesus. Others would say, you know, or, or expand on that, you know, with the fact that Jupiter is the son of Saturn. All right, you got to put it all together. So Jupiter is Saturn's son or Satan's son. We're talking Zeus plays second fiddle to nobody. So you put it together. Satan's demons have different names in different countries. Zeus is the head demon of Greek hierarchy. In Britannia, the head demon is called Esus. Jesus dropped the J. There is no J. Esus. Esus and Zeus always demanded human sacrifice. We're talking blood. We're talking Amun Ra, an equivalent of Zeus in Egypt. We're talking son, son, son. Zeus was called Hove. Oh, now you got the big homie Hove, right? He's just calling out Zeus, man. We're talking Rome, right? The Romans borrowed their entire pagan pantheon from Greece. Zeus was called Hove, man. Now you got Jehovah, right? And as the father of the false gods, he was also called Jupiter. Bang! Zeus is Jupiter, is Jesus. Jesus is Jupiter. They worship Jupiter. They worship Zeus. Where did that go? You think they just stopped? Give me one example in all of history where heathens just stopped being heathen. 
Show me one time where just heathens just all repented as a whole nation without the creator. You know, they just say, you know what? We're going to put down Jupiter. We're going to put down our idols. We're going to put down Zeus. We'll put it all down. All the sun worship. Does it make sense that they did that and slaughtered you at the same damn time? Is that the same energy, the same frequency that they will put down idols but then slaughter you? Or would they flip it and say, hey, you guys are idol worshippers. Uh, uh, not us. We worship the one Zeus, the one Isus, the one Jupiter, which is Nibiru. Jupiter is Nibiru. Uh-oh. The Romans. All right, so the Romans spread the worship of Jupiter, Zeus, throughout their empire. A profound peace called the Pax Romana prevailed into the region of the mad emperor Ka Caligula, Caligula. The glorious resurrection of the Messiah took place in 30 AD, ah, which was the 19th year of Tiberius Caesar when Satan's defeat, with Satan's defeat in the Pax Roma, a glorious golden age should have commenced for the entire world. But alas, that was not the case. So in their version, their Messiah, they're linking it with their Titus. They're linking it with their Caesar, Caesar the Christ. And they say, oh, well, you know, according to prophecy, then I mean, it's supposed to be a golden age, right? Oh, it didn't happen. So that must not have been the Messiah. After his expulsion from heaven, Satan took total possession of Caligula. The Messiah began his ministry exactly 483 years after the end of Babylonian captivity. Wow, so if we put that back in our chronology, what is that? We're just surfing away 483 years. All right. Oh yeah, man, we're talking Kitsukoda. We know, you know the comparison they making already to the foundational legend of you. All right, man. So... The Messiah began his ministry exactly, exactly, <laughs> all right, 483 years after the end of Babylonian captivity of the Jews. We're talking about the Babylonian exilarchs, right? So 483 years after the Babylonian captivity, he began 483 years after the Babylonian captivity, he began. 483 years, you know, we got, I'm trying to make sure we ain't missing nothing. 483 years after the end of the Babylonian captivity. That's when his ministry began. So it, so it ended the same 400 years prior. You know what I mean? I'm surfing it with y'all, man. So where would that push this back to? Would this mean that he began 483 years after the captivity, which would push it back to about 600 A.D.? You know what I mean? So, you know, how does this fit into year one at 1054? And when was the actual Babylonian captivity? And how was it? You know what I'm saying? Then you start tracing that into the Genghis Khan and the takeover here and the Khan on Khans and all that stuff. Oh, man. Yeah, so we're talking Tiberius. Incidentally, the start of the first Crusades, so and now we've got the Crusades popping off back at this time, 1054. Initially, the start of the first Crusade for the liberation of the Holy Scepter is dated 1096. On the other hand, medieval churches sources the story of the Savior's Passion, Pilate's letter to Tiberius, which describes the events connected with Christ in greater detail. Then do the Gospels maintain that immediately after Christ's resurrection, Pilate was called to Rome and there put to death, and that Caesar's army was sent to Jerusalem where it captured him. Today, such assertions are considered medieval conjectures, and as much as nothing is mentioned in Scalabra's chronology about any Roman campaign to Jerusalem in the 30s of the 1st century AD. However, if Christ's resurrection is dated at the end of the 11th century, this assertion by the medieval sources takes on solid literal sense, i.e. the Messiah's resurrection 
Joshua's resurrection happened in conjunction with the first crusade during which Jerusalem was taken. The picture that emerges from this as discovered by the scientists and his followers is that practically all the story which is attributed to dates earlier than 900 listen up this is very clear and very very important because this is you know what i'm saying the conclusion really of all this chronology all this astronomical you know what i'm saying correlation the picture that emerges from this as discovered by the scientist and his followers is that the practicality is that practically all of the story practically every single bit of the story which is attributed to dates every bit of this story that's attributed to any date earlier than 900 AD consists of duplicates so anything before 900 AD practically I mean you got your exceptions but practically all all of the story based on this researcher's research and these groups of researchers that are cooperating there, you know what I'm saying, timelines and breaking this shit apart about the added thousand years. Now they're saying any dates earlier than 900, all the stuff you're thinking happened in the BCs, all these dates, all these dates, anything earlier than 900 consists of duplicates, the originals of which are found in the time frame 900 to 1600 AD. What? The originals, the real deal, the real spill, the real shit, your real story is found in the time frame 900 to 1600 AD. And what you're hearing being shipped back into the past, blasted into the past, dumped in different names and different titles and different places are duplicates and phantoms to mimic history to make you feel like you've been asleep longer than you actually have. Wakey, wakey. Eggs and turkey bakey. Wake up, man. It's about that time, right? Break the spell, you know? Get original again. OG. Get your kingdom, you know? normal things it's normal for you to have a kingdom you know it's normal for you to have land you know what i'm saying you should have to work for somebody else man to provide for your family man you should have your people your community your tribe providing for each other man but the originals happen in the time frame of 900 to 1600 so we're talking joshua the mashiach being born Around this time, which they are pretty much targeting that 1054 AD. Now, in particular, each event described in a contemporary textbook as having happened earlier than 900 AD. So any of this shit they say is going down before 900 AD. Any contemporary in a contemporary textbook as having happened. All right, so each event described in a contemporary textbook as having happened earlier, anything happening earlier than 900, is a concoction, or excuse me, concatenation. Yeah, I got look. You know what I mean? Hold up, man. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you just got to, you know what I'm saying, let them uh, do their thing. You know what I mean? Sometimes you got to let them do their thing, man. <laughs> I got a war drums playlist going on, man. It's going down. Let's get it. Ah, man. Ah, man. Hold up. Concat. Concatenation. We got to get that. Because we got to be clear. Concatenation. Here we go. Ah, interesting. This is from the 1600s. We we're just talking 900 to 1600, right? So this word is from circa 1600. From late Latin, concatenation or shianum. 
nominative, uh, a linking together, syncretinize, a chain, a noun of action from past part, participle stem of concatenare to link together with together, a chain of events that they're just linking together in their own free time according to their own will and their own agenda. So anything, anything, any contemporary textbook as these events described in contemporary textbooks as having happened earlier than 900 is a concatenation, a linking together of events of several later events. Later, these medieval chronographers or chronologers, man, they, they, they really did a doozy on us, right? They really got us in a spell and a doozy, right? Because all the history you think you're getting from the B.C.s and Titus and Spacen and Flavius all happened between 900 and 1600, man. Hey, bro, bro, you just got invaded. Hey, sis, my sister, you just got invaded. Big homie, you just got invaded. Little homie, you just got invaded. In other words, it is a stratified stratified chronicle glued together glued together linked chained glued together from pieces relative relatively connected to each other practically identical among themselves wow so then it goes into uh, totally for the mankles investigation man so wow man you know i didn't uh, you know, i never never know what i'm uh Start digging deeper into, man. But we're just talking Tiberius in the 15th year of Tiberius. Caesar the Messiah. They're calling Caesar the Messiah or Caesar the Christ. He was called Christ before the Christ. You called Christ was Christ. The Messiah began his three and a half year ministry. This was exactly 483 years from the f first year of Cyrus the Persian. So we can start putting this together according to the 1054. You know what I'm saying? Chronology of Fernamenko, after his death, Tiberius was canonized and worshipped as Jupiter, which means he's also worshipped as Jesus. And he's called Caesar, the Messiah, or the Christ. So this Christ was worshipped as Jupiter. Right, 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 right. Jupiter, who was also... Zeus. Zeus was called Hove. He was also Jupiter. Zeus. And Zeus is Isus. Zeus is Isus. Isus, Jesus. And every time you're talking Jesus, remember, you just say, Hell Zeus. Hell Zeus. Isus. Hey Zeus. Uh, the Spaniards got it right. Hey Zeus. Hey Zeus. Hell Zeus. All right, man. We're jumping back into it, man. We're at the 22-minute mark. Let's get it popping, man. Love again to the fam, man. Victor Mac. There we go. Victor Mac. Love to you, Vic, man. Appreciate you, man, for dropping this drop. Let's go ahead and make it happen. Surf this wave. And, you know, I don't know how long the series is going to be. You know, we're going to just cover it, man. We're just going to cover it. If I can find my link, man. I got so much on here. All right, here we go. That was already in place. The Imperial Cult. Let's go. Which was dedicated to promoting the idea of Caesar as a god. As a god. Alright, we just got this Tiberius, Caesar, Christ, who they call the Messiah or the Christ or the God. That's why they said Jesus is God, because they want Caesar to be God, because they have to be worshipped as God to put you in this type of hijack, to put you in this type of leg lock. You in a straight up chokehold, man. You in a straight up chokehold, trying to get some air, man. They got to be worshipped as gods to put you in this type of chokehold, man, to jam you up like this, to give you this type of jam up, man. These people have gone all out. Why? Once you realize they've gone all out, you have to look in the mirror. You got to look up to your creator and say, wow. So it's true. They went through all this effort. All I need is the evidence that they went through all this effort to hide me from me. 
All you need to know is that they went through all this effort to hide you from you, to hide us from each other. And that should give you all the drop of who you are. Let go. Another part of the puzzle is the Roman imperial cult. Why is it important? Well, because it coincides with that same period of time as the emergence of the Christ cult. You had a whole social community. The whole social structure of these conquered territories um, was governed by the imperial cult. And if you wanted to succeed, the key social community to join was the imperial cult. because that's where all the movers and shakers were. This idea of the emperor becoming a, a, an object of worship was well established in the Roman system before Vespasian and Titus came along. It was prevalent in, in all major centres. It had its own priesthood. There was a ceremony, an annual celebration, annual games for the imperial cult. Now, it had many characteristics which would later colour the Christian cult. It grew in the same centres. It made claims that were later transferred to Christ. The Julio-Claudians had claimed that they were of divine descent and that they were therefore legitimate. Their power base was the Roman aristocracy, the Roman nobility. All of that collapsed into this power vacuum. Vespasian was declared emperor by the troops by the Roman army. So effectively, it was a military coup. With the change of dynasty, they have to create a whole mythology to legitimize that dynasty. At the same time, they're creating a whole mythology to counter Jewish messianism. Somewhere along the line, those two things get mixed together. When Vespasian died, Titus began the process of having his father deified. This is a complicated process because only the Roman Senate can bestow on an individual the title of Deus or God. Titus came to the Senate and presented evidence that the life of his father had been divine. Certainly this would have included the military campaign that the Flavians waged through Judea. And it's at this time I think the Gospels were written because the theological structure in the Gospels of a God the Father and the Son of God, is the same one that Titus would have been presenting to the Roman Senate. Well, the Roman Senate did accept Titus's evidence, and Vespasian was deified and became a god. Titus, therefore, became a son of God. The Arch of Titus that still stands in modern Rome today is inscribed with a dedication to the divine Titus, son of the divine Vespasian, or son of a god. This imperial cult set up to worship Caesar as god also provided the basis for the structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Now the rituals, paraphernalia and symbols of paganism were transferred wholesale to the Christian Church. The most Obvious and clear example is where the title of the pagan chief priest of Rome, the Pontifex Maximus, became the title of the Pope, the Christian Pope. If you look at who held the original bishop positions in the Catholic Church in those early times, you will see that they are members of the same pagan aristocracy. They simply changed their clothing a little bit. They wore the same garments, but they wore slightly different headdresses. They had become from being a priest of a pagan cult to being a priest of Rome. Where the Vatican now stands, there was once a pagan temple which celebrated the mysteries of a dying and resurrecting God-man who wasn't Jesus. There are many churches in Rome, I've been to a few, where you go above into the church and there is Jesus, and you go underneath and there's a little sanctuary of Mithras. Mm. And it's basically the same figure. Whoa. So this is who they were already rocking with before they built the Vatican Church there. They already had a temple to Mithras. Ra, ra, let go. So the Roman plot to invent Christianity is just so clever when you think about it. Through the Pope, who is God's representative on earth, 
they no longer needed expensive standing armies, mm. wars and punishment of disobedient peasants. They could, through religion, rule their subjects. Hijack 101. Over time, Roman Christianity propagated throughout the empire by way of the mass media of the day, the Roman roads. The Romans must have approved of this new religion because, as some scholars ask, if the Gospels really were Jewish literature about a Roman sentenced criminal, why wouldn't they have been destroyed? One of the really surprising things for me was to realize the extent of Roman control of propaganda and of literature. So that when you suddenly get all of this Christian literature arising in this period, one has to ask, well, how did that happen? The conclusion that one has to reach is that that could not have happened without some degree of complicity uh, on the part of, uh, of the Romans. So that uh, one is led to the conclusion that the Romans must be involved in the production of this literature. To produce and disseminate this literature was a huge undertaking, and the Flavians undoubtedly had collaborators. We know they were funded by the wealthiest family in the world at this time, the Alexanders, a Jewish family who served as Rome's tax collectors in Egypt. Like the Herods in Judea, the Alexanders had strong motivation to keep the Jews' messianic movement from threatening their position and their wealth. One of their family members was Philo of Alexandria, a famous Jewish theologian who was already writing works that combined Jewish beliefs with the modern Greek and Roman pagan beliefs of the day. Many scholars agree that his writings form the basis for much of the philosophy of Christianity. In these pages is uh, practically every concept that you can find within Christianity. He combined Greek philosophy, and he took that and he combined it with Judaism. On top of that, he was from an extremely wealthy family. And this is important because you have to follow the money when you're looking at major trends, new paradigms being set. And if you look at his family, then you start seeing, uh, well, this is interesting because now we're starting to come across the Flavians again. His relatives were very involved with the Flavians. That whole area is where we want to look very closely for the Christian origins. It's from exactly this same circle of people that you get the first signs of Christian ideology, and they all lead to the rise of the Flavian dynasty. Another wealthy influential character, Princess Bernice, was from the Herod family in Judea. She's the granddaughter of Herod the Great, a product of the Herod's intermarriage with the conquered Jewish ruling messianic lineage. Princess Bernice appears in the New Testament, which makes her an interesting character. She had two or three husbands and then became the mistress of Titus. So you can see this again, rather like dynasty here. You know, powerful people, mixed marriages, you know, shacking up with the conqueror. Um, yeah, and it's really where Joe Atwell takes his idea of a conspiracy to write the New Testament. But let him say it in his own words. Bernice was a Herod related by marriage to the Alexanders, and of course later she became the mistress to Titus. The fact that she was so closely linked with the Flavians shows you that the three families were very unified in financial, romantic, and likely theological issues. By the looks of things, this coalescence seemed to have brought about a dynamic that led to the synthesis of Judaism and paganism and eventually became Christianity. So th this is a very key time period. I believe that the Gospels were actually written under the control of the Herods, the Alexanders, and the Flavians. These families had the motivation to create Christianity and with the expertise in Judaism that the Alexanders and the Herods had, they had the actual technical ability to come up with these stories that are fulfillment of Hebraic 
prophecies. So it seems the Flavians had the motivation, the means, and the collaborations through which they likely constructed and began disseminating Christianity. And if our scholars are correct, one of the documents they left behind are the Gospels themselves. I began working on the study of the Gospels in the 1970s, and I look at texts in terms of how were these composed, what does understanding their structure tell you about who wrote them, and why they were written. These texts were not independent Jewish texts, but they were created as literary works using classical literary models. If we expect that this is the testimony of witnesses, we've got a major problem. We actually have four anonymous documents. They were not written by the named people on those documents. Mm. This is simply church tradition that the Gospels are so named according to Mark, according to Matthew. So this idea that the, the Gospels are reliable testimony is patent nonsense. Why are the Gospels called Gospels? That's a critical question. <laughs> the word Gospel in Greek is Evangelion, and it means good news of military victory. Wow. Whose military victory are we celebrating here? Wow. Good news of military victory. Hijack 101. So this is the new test. So whose military victory, man? I mean, King James came with this new test after colonizing your ass. Is that a military victory? When King James issued two patents, two companies, Plymouth and London Company, with longitude and latitude to colonize you in America in 1606. Was that good news of a military victory? And is that why we got the 1611 popping up? Here in these Gospels. Well, it seems to me that we are celebrating clearly the Roman military victory because these events, the uh, Battle of Gadara, the Battle of the Lake of Galilee, the success of the Battle of Jerusalem, these are battles that the Romans won. I mean, can we serve the rave? I mean, is this really all a, a King James affair, man? The Flavius and all this? Is this all connected? I mean, all the real history happened when? All the real history happened when? Between 900 and 1600 A.D. Practically all of the story, all of your history, which is attributed to dates earlier than 900 A.D., consists of duplicates, fakes, frauds, illusion, trickery. The original, the real spill of which are found in the time frame 900 to 1600. So when they're writing about their victory over you and you're just hearing about it in 1611, what victory just happened? And what is the real spill, man? What's the real spill, you Why are the Gospels celebrating battles that the Jews lost if these things were written by the Jews? The fact that the Gospels are known to us in Greek and, and not in uh, uh, Aramaic or Hebrew hmm. is, I think, just evidence of, of their authorship. They were not written by any followers of Jesus who would have surely spoken Aramaic. And if they had been fishermen and simple folk, they would not have had the literal skills to write them anyway. If we look closely, there actually are clues in the Gospels that point to who the true authors were. A lot of the Christian literature advocates turning away from the Jewish law and obeying Roman law. Well, this, this fits perfectly into Roman propaganda purposes. And then you have, in general, the portrayal of Jesus as the peaceful Jew who is wandering around in what is depicted as a sort of pastoral scenes, talking to fishermen and farmers and so forth, when in fact, this is a war zone. Judea is a war zone. And you ask yourself, well, why is it not portrayed as a war zone? I mean, they really had it down pat. They, kept, they have Jesus saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, which is basically in response to talking about money. Whose benefit would that be? It's so blatantly obvious. The perception of Roman characters in the Gospels, they're all interpreted in a favorable light. They are pro-Roman. 
they do not depict the Romans as the forces of evil. They reverse that. It's the Jews who become the forces of darkness. It's very striking that various passages in the Gospels refer to the Jews as some people separate from the heroes of, of Jesus and his disciples. The Jews are those who object. The Jews are those who try to thwart the divine plan. Now, that gives us a clue, certainly, to who were the true authors of this book. They are works of literature created by people who are trained in Jewish literature, but whose values are pro-Roman. The Romans wanted to promote anti-Semitism, and so they arranged the story of the beloved man-god, Jesus Christ, to appear as if the Jews had brought about his death. Because of this, uh, the Jews would have to suffer anti-Semitism throughout history. So this was a piece of work that could not have been done except by a fairly established literary team, such as the literary team that was in Rome actually writing the books of Josephus. I mean, that was written by a literary team, and it was written uh, as one of the um, attempts to give prominence to the Flavian Caesars, which the Gospels also do. So it is extremely likely that the Gospels, um, as a form of epic, uh, designed to magnify allegorically the Roman Caesars, is also written um, at the court of the Flavian emperors. But the Jesus story takes place many decades before the Flavians came to power. Why would the Flavians create a work about a Jewish Messiah that wasn't even from their own era? The Gospels were very precisely backdated 40 years. Jesus' ministry was started in 30 CE, exactly 40 years from the destruction of the temple. Hmm. His ministry ends at Passover, 33 CE, which is 40 years before the end of the Jewish-Roman War, which occurred at Passover in 73 CE with the famous Battle of Masada. The Gospels are backdated into the period of Pontius Pilate, that is to say, before the First Jewish War, which is to say, in the Julio-Claudian period. But this is typical of Flavian literature. It's a Flavian technique. What they do is they backdate this story into the period of their enemies, mm. namely the Julio-Claudians. And so, generation after generation of Christian scholar and... A Julio-Claudians, so into the date of their enemies. Interesting, so, you know, that's another dynasty to dig on if those are enemies but let's go even secular historians go hunting in the julio-claudian period for the origins of the gospels they don't really find any answers there there are allusions in the gospels to the destruction of the temple the most reasonable answer to that is that these texts were written after the destruction of the temple that is to say in the flavian period after the change of dynasty this backdating of the story of Jesus Christ, 40 years earlier from the time the Gospels may actually have been written, explains why many of the prophecies of Jesus came true within exactly 40 years. What does this all add up to? In my view, the thing that is most significant is the research by Joseph Atwell in his book Caesar's Messiah, which suggests that the Gospels were actually created as works of Roman propaganda at the end of the Roman Jewish War under the reign of the Flavian emperors, that is Titus Caesar and Vespasian Caesar. And if you end up worshipping Jesus, what you will really end up doing is worshipping Caesar in disguise. Hey. This may have been how the Flavians finally got the Jews to worship Caesar as a god, by giving them Jesus Christ a messiah more to the Romans' liking. But is there any actual history to this character? Where did he really come from? The mystery to me begins with his very name. In Greek, Jesus means savior and Christ means the messiah. This didn't strike me as something you would call a young child. These two words are already important within Judaism before Jesus Christ supposedly existed. 
major biblical figures to a Jewish Greek speaking population. David is called the Christ or the anointed by them. We're just talking about the anointed. Joshua would also be the anointed. Moses would be the anointed. Now they give you one version of the anointed. They put that iconoclastic figure everywhere on everything and you forget about the actual crucifixion. They push there's, you know, 1,000 years here, push yours 1,000 years back, switch you up, spin you on a ball, tell you you come from some other place. You did, They just found you here. So you forget about your crucifixion and what was invaded and taken from you. So you don't put your story back together when they're talking about invasions. When they're talking about Jerusalem falling, you're not even thinking about Peru. You're not thinking about Peru Salam. You're not thinking about how they rolled up on Mexico and Peru and how Columbus himself said, I'm coming to America to conquer the holy city and Mount Zion. Is that the Vespasian situation? I mean, remember, all the real shit really happened between 900 and 1600. So where does Columbus really play? They got different names. I know Columbus... Columbus sounds nothing like Vespasian. I get it. They know that too. So they use the same story, switch the names, you know what I mean? Then drop them off in different places. And now you're looking at some other fictional illusion or duplicates. Because practically all the story, which is attributed to dates earlier than 900, consists of duplicates. But the originals of which are found in the time frame, 900 to 1600 A.D. The originals are found in the time frame, 900 to 1600. How does Columbus really play? And did we take that story and then create more history by duplicating the Columbus story in the invasion of you? Are you the original? Is your invasion the original? We're just talking concoct concoctination, man. <laughs> We're learning together, man. We're linking this together, man. Hey, uh, Negro. Copper color Negro, you know. Color of that uh old grandma penny. All those shoes. The American, you are the American. You are the native of America originally applied. This is in 1828. I mean, this is the real spiel. This is the real definition. So which invasion is the original of these so-called Jews or Israelites? Why did Columbus bring a Hebrew interpreter to talk to you? He's looking for the Grand Khan in Cuba. Cuba used to be called Hawa Hawa. And he's looking for the Israelite king in an island called Hawa Hawa. And Kendrick Lamar just told you he's an Israelite. Don't call me black no more. That word is only a color. It ain't facts no more. Why is that word a color? Because if we talk color, we talk Negro. We're talking copper color. We're talking the conduit, the coil. We're talking about the fiery flying dragon, serpent devouring, devouring the venomous snakes, the serpent that devours the venomous snakes. We're talking cons. We're talking frequency, energy. We're talking conduit, energy, coil, copper, color, races that are found here by the European that were invaded. So is this the original invasion of these copper color races or Hebrews here? These copper color people don't care about being American no more. They think they come from Africa. They don't care about their actual invasion. They're stuck in 70 A.D. Man, you know, we got invaded in Jerusalem way over there in 70 AD, but now I'm here, see? Deuteronomy 28, 68, we'll be taken here out in ships and brought to some. Nah, you was taken from here in ships and brought to Africa. You was taken from here in ships and brought to Europe. Brought back to Egypt, brought back to bondage. Copper colored races. You were in Babylonian captivity we have babylonian exilarchs we're talking priest kings we're talking Prester johns we're talking david we're talking david the christ or david the mashiach we're talking joshua or hawashi hawa 
We're talking the copper colored races that were found here. But then they invaded us, took our title so that this 1828 definition now is applied to the descendants of Europeans born in America. Oh, yeah. So they can go anywhere. The earth is their turf. It used to be your turf, people. But now the Europeans born here call themselves Americans. They truly believe they are. They truly believe it. Except they can't go back too far in time and look at a dictionary that lets them know that they're not American if they're not copper colored. Body bag for the illusion. We're talking body bag. We're talking Daniel. We're talking Dawood, the Mashiach. Gillis would already be called Christ. Bang. Their ears would already be acclimated to accepting this this title. That the, so it isn't just a, a unique name of a single person who it just suddenly popped up. Hmm. What did we actually know about Jesus Christ the man? I don't think that Jesus can be historically defended. I don't think there's any evidence that we can extend to that particular Jesus. So when you actually <laughs> set out to investigate the historical Jesus as opposed to the Christ of faith, you very abruptly enter a void. You find that whereas you might imagine the core details of Jesus are readily known and accessible, you actually discover there's no such thing. Nada. Further, there had never been any archaeologic evidence of Jesus Christ that had ever been discovered. You cannot find an established and incontrovertible biography of Jesus at all. It doesn't exist. You enter a strange twilight zone of early Christian belief. What we have here is, is not a movement that's grown on the accretion of legends on an, a real flesh and blood man, but instead the, the development of a religious movement around the idea of a man. There isn't even an actual physical description of what Jesus looked like anywhere in the Gospels. The presentation of the Jesus character, it's somewhat of a composite of many messianic leaders of the time. Many messianic leaders of the time, most or all of whom came to a bad end, usually by crucifixion, because crucifixion was the Roman punishment for seditious activity. Crucifixion was their punishment, was the Roman punishment. Crucifixion. So many of the Mashiachs at that time were taking L's, that were taking L's, was happening by crucifixion anyway. And they said there's no, there's no description of this hijack. Man, we're just talking Zeus. We're definitely talking melanated celestial beings like Europa, melanated celestial we're talking about their hijacks are all melanated. We're talking celestial, but their creations aren't necessarily melanated. I don't know if they can always duplicate the melanin. I don't think that they can always duplicate the original. But that's for another topic and another time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, you can get in revelations, you know, the, the feet of feet of brass and the hair of wool and all that and all that. But you're talking about the gospels. All right, well, let's get it, man. So last time we got it on this piece, so, you know what I mean? Before we get back in the piece, so, there's a uh, cool little comment, man, from the homie 9 uh, X, 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 X. All right, so, what's up, 9 Super X? He says, Muhammad is... Ibn, Ibn, Al-Arabi. We're going to get into this Arabi a little bit. So, who was born in Spain, 1211. Remember, the real history happened when? Between 900 and 1600. This applies to Muhammad too. So, yeah, you heard, you know, he was born in 500, you know, 600, something like that. Yeah, all right, all right. Or... <laughs> We got to do the or now. That's how we dig it. We're surfing the wave. We're throwing the question now. I'm not coming at you like I know something. You know what I mean? I'm coming at you like, hey, you know, here's some very, uh, you know, inter interesting linkings. You know what I'm saying? This is linking up in an interesting way. And how does this apply to us as copper color people? 
So Muhammad is Ibn al-Arabi who was born in Spain in 1211. Alright, so fam is saying that the real Muhammad, the surfing way, Ibn al-Arabi was born in Spain in 1211 and traveled to North and West Africa with his philosophy and gathered many followers. Islam was created in 1889 in France by the Vatican. We're going to dig on it. You know what I mean? This is not just for us to, oh, prove it. You know, just just dig on it, man. You put this in, you start reconning this. If you care about it, you know what I mean, you're going to recount it for yourself because no one has to prove anything to you. You got to dig on it yourself if you really want to get this drop. If you really want to surf this wave, you got to, you know what I'm saying, dodge all hijacks. You got to be committed to dodging all hijacks, man. Put your theory out there. From day one, we've been putting our theory out there. No matter what you said, we put our theory out there. And here we are. Still linking up the same foundation. All praise to Allah. Together. All right? So here we go. So Muhammad is Ibn al-Arabi, born in Spain, 1211, and traveled to North and West Africa with his philosophy. So he gathered followers in North and West Africa. Islam was created in 1889 in France by the Vatican to control the Turkic and Arab tribes they conquered during World War I with the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. So after World War One, these Turkey and Arab tribes, they created Islam. Remember, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're creating these, uh, you know, it's all stemming, you know what I'm saying, from a way of controlling these people without having to, you know, use any more war. So they create to control these people, Islam, surfing the wave in 1889 in France, Vatican. All right, to control the conquered Arabs during the World War I with the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. They took Psalms and the Gospels and combined them. And that is called syncretinizing. That is called linking it all, all up in one pot, right? So they took Psalms and they took this Gospels, all right, this hijack, and they combined it. So they had a little bit of drop in it. Which is what you relate to when you get into this stuff. These religions, you relate to the drop. You're like, there's some drop in here. I didn't really look too deep. Well, that's the drop that's connected to foundational legend. That's the drop that's connected to you. This stuff was created on you to control you. Without the soul. It's psychological warfare. It's a frequency war. You got to vibrate up. They took Psalms and the Gospels and combined them with the writings of Aribi, Arabi who created Sufism to create the Quran, Kuwa, Ra, or Wisdom of the Sun. Wow. So Quran, brother saying, is Kuwa, K-U-A, dash, Ra. We're just talking Ra. And <laughs> you don't think this is all connected? Because <laughs> when we talk Ra, again, again, we can't tell Ra. Amun Ra is the equivalent of Zeus. So you're talking the same deity, the same sun deity, the same energy, the same hijack, the same what? Magic spell. Breaking the magic spell at last. The most powerful of Satan's princi principalities is called Zeus. His most powerful goon is Zeus. Remember, Zeus is the sun. Jupiter is the son of Saturn or Satan. Saturn, Jupiter is the sun. This is amazing, man. Good shit right here, man. So, so the writings of Arabi who created Sufism to create the Quran, Kua, Ra, or wisdom of the sun. So, Ra. Sun, Zeus, all the same. Same hijack. So we get at one, we get at both. The first Hajj was in 1927. You dig on it. I don't know. You dig on it. All right? You tell me it's the first Hajj was in 1927. And the first time Islamic scholars and, 
and such met was in 1922. That's why when one reads old books, they are called Mohammedans or Mohammedans. Remember, we got the Baphomet connection with all this. Not Muslims or Islamic. Muhammad means one worthy of praise. All right? So again, it's kind of like Christ. It just means you're worthy of praise. Titles, titles, titles. All right, so let's dig a little bit on Ibn al-Arabi. Now, he's born 1165 to 1240, so he's right in that situation. 900 to 1600 was a Muslim mystic. Mm, sounds like good old Muhammad already, huh? He's a, he's a mystic. All right, philosopher, poet, and writer. See, all this is linking up with the Muhammad you think you know too, right? who came to be acknowledged as one of the most important spiritual teachers within Sufism, the mystical tradition of Islam. Ibn Arabi was a prodigiously prolific author. Wow, so he wrote a lot, huh? Like the Quran, Quran, Quran. Prolific author producing at least 300 works on various subjects with his own mystical philosophy reaching its quintessential expression in the seals of wisdom mm, gotta dig on that y'all got a pdf by robbie the seals of wisdom man his writings emphasize the potential of the human being becoming a perfect person and he is known as the prime exponent of the doctrine of wadat unity of being Though he never used this term in his, any of his works, Ibn Arabi exerted significant influence on Islamic spirituality, not only among his immediate circle of friends and disciples, disciples, many of whom were considered spiritual masters in their own right, but also on succeeding generations, deeply affecting the subsequent course of spiritual thought and practice in Arabic, Turkish, and Persian-speaking worlds. So the entire practice changed when it came to him. Is this when it shifted from Mohammedan or Mohammedans or Mohammedanism, Mohammedism to Islamism? Is that the spiritual influence on Islamic spirituality from Arabi? Deeply affecting the subsequent course of, of spiritual thought and practice in Arabic, Turkish and Persian speaking worlds in recent years. His writings have also become a topic of interesting academic interest in the West, leading to the establishment of an international academic society whose primary goal is to further the understanding of this great philosopher's teachings. How does this relate with your Muhammad? Are you saying that Muhammad's teachings was better than this Muhammad's teachings? Prove it. Prove it. Because it seems like this mystic changed the entire game. Spiritual influence deeply affected all these subsequent generations. Bio. Alright, so Arabi, also called, he was born Abu Ad Allah Muhammad Ibn Ali Ibn Muhammad. Muhammad. Alright, so I know that IBN is a title, so I'm just going to say Arabi. Also known as Muhammad Muhammad. Muhammad Muhammad was born in Mercia in southeastern Andalusia, Spain, 1165. So was he just born and sort of brought into this higher level for the specific reason of influencing these people and pacifying these people and putting them into a spell where he was immersed in the fertile metropolitan climate of Iberian Spain. We're talking more. He spent his youth as a student learning the most current theories of mathematics, cosmology, linguistics, and theology. Sounds a lot like that, Muhammad, right? As a teenager, he experienced a sudden revelation in which he was interrupted from his carefree existence by a divine call. He got visited by an angel too. Wait a minute. In the middle of one of these nightly parties in Seville, oh, we're back to Seville, Spain. 
That's what we're getting out from the Biblioteca de Colombina in Seville, Spain. Now we're in these nightly parties in Seville. He heard a, a voice calling him. Oh, Muhammad. <laughs> Damn. This is body bag, man. This is body bag for the illusion. Again, they're giving you dates on this Muhammad at, what, 500 AD, something, 600 AD. 7th century, right? And we're doing our own, you know what I'm saying, linking. They're linking, we're linking. We're getting to chronology. We're looking at it differently. We're looking at it, you know what I'm saying, through a few of these researchers. You know what I'm saying? One of them has been, you know, slaying this shit, has been opening this wide open, this Anatoly Fedomenko that we've been surfing with. 900 to 1600 AD. The originals are found in the time frame. 900 to 1600 AD. The original story is found in the time frame between 900 and 1600 AD. The original story. So this Muhammad, he's coming up around 1200, right? It was not for this that you were created, O Muhammad. This is what this angel's telling him. In consternation, he fled and went into retreat for several days in a cemetery. It was here that he had his seminal triple vision a seminal triple vision that nigga had a seminal triple vision he had a triple double 10 steals 10 assists 10 points let's go <laughs> he had a seminal triple vision in which he met and received instruction from jesus moses and muhammad <laughs> so <laughs> yeah all right, man. This is when the hijack goes too far, man. <laughs> You're going too far, hijack. You tell me this Muhammad in the 1200s was visited by Moses and Jesus. Come on, man. They don't even rock together, man. So, you know, when we say dodge the hijack, look how they're trying to pack up this hijack. To make him legit, he got to be visited by the trifecta. Jesus, Moses, and the other Muhammad. In illumination, illumination that simultaneously started started him upon the spiritual way and established him as a master of it. So he's a master. He has all of Jesus in him, all of Moses, all of Muhammad. So they're taking everyone that you're venerating, right? Even the ones that they hijacked you already to venerate. And they're saying he has it all. He has everything in one. Right? That's, that's, that's this hijack 101. So in the recent years that followed, he traveled through the Western Islamic world, visiting communities, initiating studies with various scholars and mystics in Al-Andalus and to Tunis. In 1202, he embarked on a sacred pilgrimage to Mecca, where he settled down and reflected for the next three years. This period of contemplation culminated in the writing of several works, including his Magnus Opus, the Meccan Illuminations, after his eventful sojourn in Mecca. Arabi traveled through the Levant and Anatolia and finally settled down in Damascus during this period. He raised a family, instructed numerous disciples, advised kings and rulers, complimented a vast number, completed a vast number of books, died in 1240, and his tomb is still an important pilgrimage site for Muslim groups. So he wrote over three or at least 300 works, uh, ranging from minor treatises to huge 37 volume Mecca revelations. 37 volume Mecca revelations. Well, that's way more than the Quran, right? 37 volumes. The Quran isn't 37 volumes. So is it just completely uh, bollocks? Is it crazy <laughs> to say that he, uh, you know, gave his uh, literary uh, talent to the Quara, 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 the Quara, the Quran? The seals of wisdom. Did he lend his wisdoms to this Quran when it's, when it's coming far later? So if the 1611 is already around, then when the Quran come in the 1800s or something? I mean, dude, you know, you dig it up. But we're talking about 900 to 1600s. And we're talking about the hijack and the books that they brought you in these times hijacked you. A profound visionary capacity coupled by the remarkable intellectual insight into human experience and thorough comprehension of all the traditional sciences marks out 
Arabi from comparative figures in Islam and has been tempting for scholars to characterize him as a mystical philosopher or formulation that is rather at odds with his own teaching on the limitations of philosophical thinking. He was at least as comfortable with the religious insight, Quran and Hadith scholarship, theology and mysticism as with more secular modes of inquiry. All right, all right. So, you know, you dig on that. We will be back in it because I know that's connecting in a major way. Uh, we got this a little bit before the creation of Prophet Muhammad by Alberto Rivera. He was a former Jew, uh, Jesuit priest. So this is conducted by Alberto Rivera, a former Jesuit priest. You tell me, is he play play? Editor's notes, you just never know where or when some truly insightful information is going to cross our path to share with you. How the Vatican Created Islam, the astonishing story from an ex-Jesuit priest, Alberto Rivera, which was told to him by Cardinal Bia while he was at the Vatican. So he was told by Cardinal, by Cardinal, this story. All right? So according to the introduction, this is when we go back, how about a comic book form of publication and important suppressed history about the Jesuit Vatican hand and the creation of Islam and Islam's founder, the Prophet Muhammad. I know this is real small, so I'm going to get it quickly. I know you probably can't read all that, but I'm going to get it quickly, man. Let's go. Pull up the link. You got them all. According to the introduction to what you are about to read, this information came from Alberto Rivera. A former Jesuit priest, after his conversion to Protestant Christianity, it is excerpted from the Prophet, published. Uh, it has all the publishing stuff. All right. So, since his publication, after several unsuccessful attempts on his life, he died suddenly from food poisoning. <laughs> Man, his testimony should not be silenced. Doctor Rivera speaks to us still, so he was killed. All right. Some more complete information. All right, man, let's get it. Prophet mom and let's get it. So what I'm going to tell you is what I learned in secret briefings in the Vatican when I was a Jesuit priest under oath and induction. A Jesuit cardinal named August Bia showed us how desperately the Roman Catholics wanted Jerusalem at the end of the third century or what? 12th century. Right? Because of its religious history and its strategic location, the holy city was considered a priceless treasure. This holy city is referred to America. Columbus said, I'm coming to the holy city to con coming to America to conquer the holy city. In the Biblioteca in Sevilla, Spain, the same place that this uh, Abari is coming out of. All right? So a scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem a Roman Catholic city. The great untapped source of manpower that could do this job was the child or the children of Ishmael. Here comes the Confederacy. When they say you're a Negro, or they say you're a Moor, you say, well, what tribe is that? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're a bunch of different tribes, or we're this tribe. Tribal is your reality. When you go tribal, you get real. A scheme, a scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem or America theirs right to invade you here peru had to become theirs the great untapped source of manpower that can do this job was the children of ishmael which includes the children of lot the poor arabs fell victim to one of the most clever plans ever devised by the powers of darkness early christians went everywhere with the gospel setting up small churches but they met heavy opposition both Jews and Roman governments per persecuted the believers in Christ to stop their spread. But the Jews rebelled against Rome in 70 AD. I surfed away. Roman armies under generals Titus smashed Jerusalem and created the great Jewish temples, which was the heart of Jewish worship and fulfillment of Christ's prophecy. Matthew 24. I died to hijack. Surfed away. Now in this holy place where the temple once stood, the Dome of the Rock Mosque stands today as Islam's second most holy place. You know, surf the wave. We already dug on this dome of the rock and how it's actually an outline of America. It's an outline of the four corners, uh, you know what I'm saying, California, all that. Just, you know, type in dome of the rock, uh, promised land. You'll get it. 
uh, sweeping changes were in the wind, corruption, apathy, greed, cruelty, perversion, and rebellion were eating at the Roman Empire, and it was ready to collapse. Same thing that was happening over there when they invaded you here. The persecution against Christians was useless, and they continued to lay down their lives for the gospel of Christ. The only way Satan could stop this thrust was to create a counterfeit Christian religion to destroy the work of God. So dodge all the Christian hijack. Let's get the story. All right. The solution was in Rome. Their religion had come from Babylon, ancient Babylon, which is why you go to church on Sunday, the Babylonian first day, their holy day. They worship on their first day, the Sunday, the day of the sun. You also worship because you're in ancient Babylon and your customs are all Babylonian. And all of it needed, all it needed was a facelift. So they gave it a facelift, right? You don't know what I'm talking about because they call it Christmas today, right? You don't know what I'm talking about because it's called the United States today, right? This didn't happen overnight, but began in the writings of the early church fathers. It was through their writings that a new religion would take shape. The statue of Jupiter in Rome was eventually called St. Peter. So they changed Jupiter, who is Zeus, to St. Peter. And the statue of Venus was changed to the Virgin Mary. The site chosen for its headquarters was one of the seven hills called Vaticanus, the place of diving serpent where the satanic temple of Janus stood. All right, we talked about that temple that was already there. The great counterfeit religion was Roman Catholicism called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. In Revelation 17, 5, she was raised up to block the gospel slaughter Slaughter the believers in Christ, you know, or the Hebrews, all right? Establish religions, create wars, and make the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication, as we will see. Three major religions have one thing in common. Each has a holy place where they look for guidance. Religion, Roman Catholicism looks to the Vatican as a holy city. The Jews look to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, way over there, right? And the Muslims look to Mecca as the holy city. Each group believes that they receive certain types of blessings for the rest of their lives for visiting the holy place. In the beginning, Arab visitors would bring gifts to the house of God, and the keepers of the Kaaba were gracious to all who came. Some brought their idols, and not wanting to offend these people, their idols were placed inside the sanctuary. It is said that the Jews looked upon the Kaaba as an outlying tabernacle of the lord with veneration until it became polluted with idols yeah okay <laughs> dodge the hijack no graven images and the tribal contention over a well zam zam the treasure of the kaaba and others and the offerings that pilgrims had given were dumped down the well and it was filled with sand it disappeared many years later abd al matalib Mat matalib was given visions telling him where to find the well and his treasure. He became the hero of Mecca, and he was destined to become the grandfather of Muhammad. Before this time, Augustine became the bishop of North Africa and was effective in winning Arabs to Roman Catholicism, including whole tribes. <laughs> it was among these Arab converts to, to Catholicism that the concept of looking for an Arab prophet developed. Muhammad's father died from illness and sons born to great Arab families in places like Mecca were sent into the desert to be suckled and weaned and spent some of the childhood with Be Bedouin tribes for training and to avoid the plagues in the city. After his mother and grandfather also died, Muhammad was with his uncle when a Roman Catholic monk learned of his identity and said, take your brother's son back to his country and guard him against the Jews for by God if they see him and know of him that which I know they will construe evil against him great things are in store for this brother's son of yours the Roman Catholic monk had fanned the flame for future Jewish persecutions at the hand of the followers of Muhammad the Vatican desperately wanted Jerusalem because of its religious significance but it was blocked by the Jews the Hebrews, another problem was the true Christians in North Africa who preached the gospel. <laughs> the true Christians in Africa, okay. Roman Catholicism was growing in power. 
but would not tolerate opposition. Somehow the Vatican had to create a weapon to eliminate both Jews and the true Christian believers who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. So we're talking about what? Nestorians? Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitude of Arabs as a source of manpower to do the dirty work. Some Arabs had become Roman Catholic and could be used in reporting information to leaders in Rome. Others were used in underground spy network to carry out Rome's master plan and to continue the great multitudes of Arabs who rejected Catholicism. When St. Augustine appeared on the scene, he was he knew what was going on. His monasteries looked as bases to seek out and destroy Bible manuscripts owned by the true Christians. We're just talking Hebrew. When they say true Christian, they're talking Hebrews. They're talking Israelites. The Vatican's wanted to create a Messiah for the Arabs. They wanted to create a Messiah for the Arabs. Some, so one, they could raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma, charisma who they can train. And we're talking about Ariba, Araba. And eventually unite all the non-Catholic Arabs behind him, creating a mighty army that would ultimately capture Peru Salam for the Pope. Dumb diverse is 1452. Papal Bull. They captured you here. Subjugate all these Saracens and they called you pagans. They called you pagans, right? Take away their kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, put them in perpetual servitude. That's your capture and you're reading about it. So we know the hijack, we know our chronology. Let's go. In the Vatican briefing, Cardinal Bay told us the story. A wealthy Arabian lady who was a faithful follower of the Pope played a tremendous part in this drama. She was a widow of Khadija. Khadija. She gave her wealth to the church and retired to a convent, but was given an assignment. She was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. So when they try to convert you today, Hebrews, Israelites, they're looking for their Messiah. Muhammad is the created Messiah for the Ishmaelites. You're not of that tribe. Their Christ is the anointed of the Greeks. You're not of that tribe. Who's your creator? How do you return to the creator of your sacred trees? Hijack free and restore your covenant. So she found this. Young man used by the Vatican to create a new religion and became the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. Khadijah had a cousin named Raruqwa, who was also a very faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. Teachers were sent to young Muhammad, and he had an interesting training. Muhammad studied the works of St. Augustine, which prepared him for his great calling. The Vatican had Catholic Arabs across North Africa spread the story of the great one who was about to rise up. So they started spreading the story about it. You know what I'm saying? This was all, this is all, you know what I'm saying? Psychological warfare. They started spreading the story, getting them ready, softening it up. You know how to go. They start getting you ready, uh, getting you a little cozy for this. They start spreading the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people to be chosen by their God. <laughs> While Muhammad was being prepared, he was told that his enemies were the Jews. So he was trained up, kill the Hebrews. And this is what he did, start slaughtering Hebrews. And he had Hebrew slaves and that the only true Christians were Roman Catholic. He was taught that. Others calling themselves Christians were actually wicked imposters and should be destroyed. Many Muslims believe this. Muhammad began receiving divine revelations with his wife's Catholic cousin, Raruqwa, helping him interpret them. From this came the Quran in the fifth year of Muhammad's mission. Persecution, persecution came against the followers because they refused to worship the idols of the Kaaba. Uh-oh. So he's having divine revelations. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You got this 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 revelations happening with this Arabi. He's having revelations, writing the seals of wisdom. Let's get this last part here. Muhammad instructed some of them to flee to Abyssinia. Prester John of the three Abyssinias. Where Negus Naga Nega. Negus king, the Roman Catholic king, 
accepted them. Uh, so they're hijacking your the goose. They now they call it you niggas, but they hijack niggas because they know it met King, the Roman Catholic King. They say we're talking Abyssinia, which predates Ethiopia, which is only talking about a a region of dark skinned people. There's Ethiopia of the Orient. There's the Ethiopia of the West. Ethiopia is wherever there's dark skinned people, just like India. Wherever there's dark skinned people, India. But specifically, we're talking about these over here that they're just finding. All right, these that are connected to the Creator, according to their writings. Accepted them because Muhammad's views on the Virgin Mary were so close to Roman Catholic doctrine. I guess so. It's the same thing. It's coming out of the Vatican. These Muslims received protection from Catholic kings because of Muhammad's revelations. Muhammad later conquered Mecca and the Kaaba were cleared of idols. History proves that be before Islam came into existence, the Sabians in Arabia worshipped the moon god who was married to the sun god. They gave birth to these three goddesses who were worshipped throughout the Arab world as the daughters of Allah. An idol excavated at Hazor in Palestine, 1950, shows Allah sitting on the stone or on the throne with the crescent moon on his chest. On his chest, Muhammad claimed he had a vision from Allah, and he was told, "You are the messenger of Allah." This began his career as a prophet, and he received many messages. By the time Muhammad died, the religion of Islam was exploding. The nomadic Arab tribes were joining forces in the name of Allah and his prophet Muhammad. So the whole plan worked, right? Right? Because remember. Khadijah, his cousin, looked to find this young man who could be used by the Vatican. So now that they got someone to use, they spread the good news. Some of Muhammad's writings were placed in the Quran. The Quran. Others were never published. They are now in the hands of the high-ranking holy man. All right. So we'll be back in these cardinal this situation. You know, Cardinal Bay shared this information with us. In the Vatican, he said, these writings are guarded because they contain information that links the Vatican to the creation of Islam. So you got Cardinal Bay himself telling you, sharing the information, that these writings of Muhammad are guarded because they contain information that links the Vatican to the creation of Islam. Wow. And again, we got, you know, back in this true authorship of the New Testament, we're talking about the Arius Calpurnius Piso, also linking to the same source, the same Roman source. So you have two sources linking up to create the ultimate hijack, the trifecta. You know, they're just trying to hijack tribes. So they'll take your tribe, see what's close to it, and hijack it, create duplicates, put you to sleep, get, get you to do something passive so that you're not going against them no more. This Arius Calpurnius Piso deliberately provoked the Jewish revolt in 66 so he could destroy the temple in Jerusalem for the Jews were unwilling to accept his father's story and thereby become pacified by it as it was intended. So this was intended to pacify you, but you refused to be pacified. And every story you read has you continuing to rebel against the hijack. Continuing to rebel against those who seek to pacify you. The PISO searched for a solution to the two problems. They found it in the Jewish holy books, which were the foundation, both for the rapid spread of the religion and for the zealots refusal to be governed by Rome's puppets. The Pisos mocked but marveled at the Jewish belief in their holy book or the Hebrew belief. Therefore, so they mocked it, but they marveled at it at the same time. Hijacks, right? Therefore, they felt a new Jewish book would be the ideal method to pacify the Judeans. Judah, Utah, Ute, Aztec, and copper color race found here to pacify you and strengthen their in-laws control of the country. Wow, in-laws, huh? About the year 60 AD, Dasha Hijack, Lucius Calpurnius Piso composed Er Marcos, Marcus, the first version of the Gospel of Mark, man, which no longer exists. You can't even find it no more. He was encouraged by his friend Seneca and assisted by his wife's kinsman, young Perseus the poet. Nero's mistress, later his wife, 
Papia was a pro-Jewish and, and Nero opposed the plan. So they wrote it in more of a pro-Israelite way and now it doesn't exist. The result was the Pisanian conspiracy to assassinate Nero detailed in the historian Tac Tacitus. So some wanted to give a little more drop. Now they're getting assassinated. But this attempt failed when he aborted the plot. Instead, Nero had Piso and Seneca and their fellow conspirators executed by forcing them to commit suicide. Wow. So he forced the Piso. Nero had Piso. He forced them to commit suicide. Man, so all this was going down to try to protect try to protect the what? To try to protect the who? The great secret. And what's the great secret copper color race found here? What's the real spill? Zeus is Isus, is Jupiter, is Ra, is the same sun worship, is the same hijack. And they're hijacking the foundational legend of Joshua, who himself. Now, therefore, take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man had 12 disciples. And I'm just telling you, choose your Joshua and choose up. And man, I don't know if we have time, but I just want to get a little bit of this and see how far it takes us, man. Let's just get a little piece of this. Love to the family, love to the home team. Let's go. Let's break down this world. We know that Zay is end of Zay world, Zay end of the world, end of Zay world. This thing they're showing us, they're telling us. So we know that Zay equals the. Oh no, equals the. Okay, and then we know that Bub means the bull. Okay, you can just Google it. The Bub Ranch, Bub Bulls. It's a specific type of bull. Mm. A black one. Mm. Black. Got it. So, and then we've got BL, 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 Zippa, Bale. That's pretty easy. So, with the BL, with the BL, BL, Zippa, we've got. A L the black bull. The Baal the black bull. That's Beelzebub. That is the devil. Okay? That is the devil in the Essene Gospels and Jeshua says, either you serve your holy father in heaven and your mother your mother of the earth and mother earth who gave you your body um, and the Holy Spirit or you serve Beelzebub and his devils and his demons. Okay, so now now we've got that. One more time. I'm going to turn this. You can see it a little bit better. Here, I'll write it bigger. So what I am contending is that this spirit, this Beelzebub, actually moves through human bodies and this Jezebel female character later on was... It says that she was the daughter of Baal, just like kind of how Jesus is the son of God. Um, uh, Jezebel was carrying the soul of Beelzebub. Okay? Mm. So we've got Baal. You know, they went to the temples of Baal, and, and they destroyed his temples, and then people came and said, well, we're going to send you to death. And he said, Paul, was Paul, he said, hey, if Baal is God, let him come strike me dead. And then they didn't, and then they all tore, you know, he didn't, and then so they all tore everything down. Now you think you're spinning on a ball. So you've got BL, 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 Zebub. So you've got BL, can you see it? Oh yeah, that's pretty big. Z, Bub. Okay. And that's Bill the Black Bull. Melanated. Hebrew is super easy. Mm. It's like a language of symbols, so it's actually easier than English. The Black Bull. People have seen this 
bull. Okay. People in my family have seen it. My daughter saw it with red eyes when she was little and always has the glowing red eyes. And I never told her that story in my family or anything like that. I never told her scary stories like that. So, um, and then, um, so we'll, let's look at, we'll just say for all intents and purposes, I'm just going to say Jesus, but let's just get it.